Hi, and welcome back for another Parallel Filters video. I looked at low and high pass filters in the last instalment, and I'm not done with those yet, but I want to talk about band pass filters first. And before I do so, I feel I should quickly explain this test setup I'm using. I'm guilty of assuming that everyone knows about Plugin Doctor, but I'm regularly asked about it in the comments, so that's clearly not the case. Plugin Doctor is a host application into which you can load a plugin you want to test, and you can then analyze it in various ways to check the frequency response, distortion characteristics, and so on. It's made by DDMF, and it's not expensive, so it's an option for the average plugin user and not just developers. A word of warning, however, Plugin Doctor is a host application just like a DAW, so your DAW stock plugins probably can't be tested with it. And since the latest update to version 14, I've been unable to load any Waves plugins at all. I don't know if Waves nerfed that on purpose. In some ways, I wouldn't blame them if they had. But whatever the reason, the Waves shell doesn't play ball right now, and I can't test Waves plugins at the moment. FabFilter plugins are fine, however. In this case, I've got an instance of Pro-Q3 loaded, running a bandpass filter, and we can verify that we are indeed getting a bandpass frequency response. And if we want, we can switch to show the phase shift instead. Plugin Doctor allows you to load up two different plugins simultaneously, so you can compare them or try to match their settings. But it can only test a single plugin. It can't show you the overall response from a chain of plugins. So when I need to test a more complex setup, I turn to Meta Plugin, also from DDMF. This is a plugin that can load other plugins and arrange them in complex configurations. But in this case, I've set it up with another Pro-Q3 with another identical bandpass filter, but also patched the input directly to the output, so the bandpass filter is added to the original signal and runs in parallel. And now we can see the resulting frequency response in the doctor. It's just an EQ boost. Nothing weird or funky about this at all. It's exactly the kind of bell-shaped boost you'd expect from a parametric EQ. And it works with any Q setting. No need to be careful, like when using a 12 dB low or high pass filter. You can go as wide or as narrow as you want. Note I'm using zero latency mode. Yes, there's phase shift, but it's too subtle to really matter. If we compare to the same settings in linear phase mode, the phase shift just makes the bell a little bit narrower. The 12 dB slope is important, however. Notice there's no 6 dB option for a bandpass filter. But we can go the other way, and a 24 dB setting starts to look a little funkier. Now we have these little dips either side of our boost. This actually looks to me like a potentially useful response. It seems logical that a boost that also simultaneously cuts the clutter either side will sound good in the right situation. But I'll be honest, whenever I've tried it, I've always ended up back at the 12 dB setting. Maybe I've just not found that right situation yet. So I'm not going to say this is wrong, just suggest that you be careful with it. And don't go any higher unless strange funkiness is what you're after. So okay then, what's the point? Well, here's a bandpass filter running at about 2K5. And I'm going to send all my drum shells to it. All three kick close mics, all three snare mics, all the toms. And now I can control the crucial upper mid-range region of my drums with a fader in the mixer. And of course, I can saturate the boost to add more sizzle. And compress it to shape the upper mid-range transients and stop it ever getting too extreme. This isn't the drum mixing technique I teased in the last instalment, however. This is just a colourful, dynamic EQ boost, after all. Equally valid for other parts as well as drums, and also only subtly different to a colourful, dynamic EQ applied to the drum bus. So, let's talk about drums. What's the most common symptom of a bad drum recording? I would argue, thin and weak-sounding drums. 
This can be a result of bad mic placement, or phase cancellation between mics, or a badly tuned drum, or perhaps a combination of all of the above, plus a bad sounding room. Whatever the cause, let's imagine we're trying to fix a thin and weak sounding snare drum with EQ. Now, a lot of people will tell you that if you have a bad recording, you're stuffed. There's nothing you can do to fix it in the mix. You simply have to re-record or resign yourself to a sucky mix. You can't polish a turd. I do not subscribe to this view. It depends on the specific way in which the recording sucks and, crucially, on your ability to diagnose the problem correctly. In the case of a weak and thin-sounding snare, the more technical diagnosis would probably be not enough low fundamental. The big advantage of drums over pitched musical instruments, however, is that the fundamental frequency generally doesn't change much. Here it is in our snare close mics, and it's not hard to pick it out on the analyzer. So let's try giving it a boost. I can get really narrow and surgical with Pro Q3 and pick out that one frequency without affecting higher partials at all. And actually, this does work. I can add significant extra roundness and fatness to the drum sound. With a really narrow Q setting and lots of boost, we start to hear the filter ring noticeably. We're not just boosting that partial now, we're also lengthening it and making it resonate for longer. And actually that's useful in this case. But the ringing is related to the amount of boost I apply. And usually I find that getting a satisfying extra resonance means too much boost and a drum that sounds tubby and boxy. So let's turn off this EQ and instead I'm going to send the snare mics to a parallel track with a bandpass filter inserted. Let's tune it to the low fundamental again and narrow it to pick out just that one partial. And let's give it a healthy boost so we can hear it clearly. Now I can control the ringing by adjusting the cue of the filter. And I can also, independently, control how much of that ringing I add. It doesn't really matter whether you adjust the gain in the plug-in or use the fader on the filter channel. Personally, I like to get in the right ballpark using the plug-in gain, then fine-tune it with the fader in context with the mix. I made a video a while ago about stem mastering in which I teased a parallel processing trick to fix the snare drum. I won't play the example again, because I had some difficulty getting it past content match last time. But that was literally just this. A parallel bandpass filter tuned to the snare fundamental. No other processing whatsoever. Have a listen to the difference when I take this one out. But of course you can use further processing if you want. Sometimes I like to really lean into that ringing with the tightest possible cue setting, but then tighten it up again with a gate or expander after it. This can give a really solid and consistent fat bottom end for every snare hit. This technique can also work wonders for toms. Of course each tom will have a distinct fundamental frequency, probably all different to the snare. So you'll need a parallel filter channel for every drum you process this way. But often it's just one tom out of the three that wasn't tuned well. And anyway, who cares if I need a few more channels for the mix. I'll usually dial in the gate release slower for a tom than for a snare. And I'm also more likely to add compression as well, in case the toms seem to vary in tone too much. Okay, you've probably heard of a sub-kick, right? It's an NS10 low-frequency driver, wired backwards as a microphone, and it gives you a deep, low, sub-bass thump when placed in front of a kick drum. Well, they look cool, and they do work, and can sound good. But I don't bother with any such tricks, since I discovered parallel bandpass filters for the kick drum. It's easier, saves an input channel when tracking, and works better, in my opinion. I usually take a slightly different approach for the kick. I've tuned the filter to the low fundamental once again, but this time I'm going to enable auto gain in the output section. Importantly though, before I do that, 
I'm going to drop the gain by quite a lot. The auto gain algorithm in Q3 works pretty well for conventional EQ settings, but gets rather carried away when you use a bandpass filter like this. Anyway, once you've adjusted your output gain to a suitable setting, the auto gain actually becomes really useful. It allows you to adjust the Q from relatively wide to tight and narrow without having to adjust the gain or the fader level each time, which makes it easy to dial in just the right kind of sub bass thump. Wider settings give me the kind of low end I'd expect from a sub kick mic or similar, just deep low frequency extension. But I can also narrow the cue and make that low fundamental ring for longer. Again, I can set it a bit too resonant, but then tighten that up with the gate and get a lovely, solid, consistent note for every hit. So here's a VCA channel, which I've set up to control all the parallel channels simultaneously. That's one each for the kick and snare, three for the three toms, plus the original 2K5 band for all of them. And listen to the difference when I bring them all in and out. That's not subtle, is it? And the difference can be even greater when you don't start with well-tuned, expertly played drums recorded in a nice big studio. Or, on the other hand, I could max out the cue setting for the filter, lose the gate, or maybe add hold and release to keep it open for longer, and turn the kick drum into an 808 style bass part. That's also an option. Obviously an 808 is going to want some distortion, but I'm going to use the unusual fold back wave shaper style in Saturn, so that the dynamics of the part sound almost like filter sweeping effects. And of course I'll compress that too. Another quick word of warning, however, when getting creative like this, you might think that the steeper filters might be viable options. And you might not be wrong. But you might then remember me pointing out that switching to linear phase mode makes all the funkiness go away in the frequency response and freezes up to use the steeper filters without negative consequences. However, when we're using settings that ring audibly like this, there is, kind of literally, a negative consequence, in that half of that ringing moves before the impulse instead of after it. Instead of just ringing after each kick drum hit, the ringing fades up into each hit, a bit like a reverse reverb effect. It can sound quite good when you're being more abstract and creative. Although note that I've had to use the maximum latency setting to make this sound good at such a low frequency. But you definitely want to avoid linear phase if you're just trying to achieve a fat, round drum sound. There are other applications I haven't touched on in this video. Sometimes a drum is so poorly tuned that it doesn't really have a proper low fundamental at all. No problem, just pick a frequency and synthesize one. And for that matter, what if the drum tuning doesn't fit the song? With a little care, you may be able to change the fundamental frequency of a drum, so it better fits the key of the arrangement. But those two scenarios are a bit more specialised, so I think I'll save them for a possible future tutorial. Meanwhile, I haven't finished with parallel filters. We've learned how to create shelving bands and peaking bands, but so far they're always boosting, and they don't have to. More on that next time. Thanks for watching.